uh, Rome out of the uh, English Empire as far as them having their hands in any religious part. So eventually you would get the uh, Great Bible. And as I said, the Great Bible and what Queen, Queen Elizabeth and the Bishop's Bible or what have you, you would basically get them trying to take out anything that was Romanence or that had to deal with Rome from out of the book. Talk about this before too. And um, they get it out of here. So you had around this time, since you had so many people talking against Rome, you had what developed was you had the, the Protestants or, or the Puritans. And you had these people basically going in on the language of the book, because that's basically what it came down to. So now you have these people saying, well, we can't trust Rome. Everything's in Latin. We don't know what the book is really saying. Rome is going against the book. How can we trust Rome? How can we trust it in this language? Let's do this translation. But then it became, once the translation was done, then it became, okay, well, how can we translate it so it's, you know, close to the original Hebrew or exactly what we need to be hearing? And that became the issue as well. So after the Bishop's Bible and, and all the problems that they found and flaws in that book, this is where you have the King James Version. And, and you have a lot of people who are unclear on why King James basically uh, was tasked with this with this version. So now it says here, with the death of Queen Elizabeth I, Prince James VI of Scotland became King James I of England. The Protestant clergy approached the new king in 1604 and announced their desire for a new translation to replace the Bishop's Bible, first printed in 1568. They knew that the Geneva Version had won the hearts of the people because of its excellent scholarship, accuracy, and exhaustive commentary. However, they did not want the controversial marginal notes proclaiming the Pope and Antichrist, etc. Essentially, the leaders of the church desire a Bible for the people with scriptural references only for word clarification or cross references. So like we have with the presidency, you have a president who runs, you know, the war on terror. He runs on, you know, the war on drugs or what have you. This was basically King James way to get in with the people and basically come in as saying, I'm going to be the king that's going to give us the correct Bible. And you have a lot of people who don't understand one, you know, you have with the Hebrew saying that, you know, King James gave us a perfect uh, Bible that he was you know, basically touched by God and tasked to give us this book in the correct way. So now even after the King James Version was out, you know, for over 200 years, it still wasn't considered right. So the whole notion that, you know, God put a spirit on King James or King James had this, you know, this, you know, spiritually, biblically right, you know, process to give us the perfect Bible or that he was touched by God or angels in some kind of way to give us a perfect book is bull because the book wasn't considered correct. We know in the 1800s, they took out the Apocrypha and there was a lot of flaws found in the book and had to change a lot of words over. So still, even with King James, the book we still use to this day, we didn't have a perfect book. Now it's saying here, a committee established by the Convocation of Canterbury in February 1870 reported favorably three months later on the idea of revising the King James Version. Who is this we're talking about? We're talking about white men. This is white people. Two companies were formed, one each for the Old and New Testaments. A novel development was the inclusion of scholars representatives of the major Christian traditions, except Roman Catholics, who declined the invitation to participate. Another invocation was the formation of parallel companies in the United States, hmm, to whom the work of the British scholars was submitted and who in turn sent back their reactions. The instructions to the committees made clear that only a revision, not a new translation, was contemplated. The New Testament was published in Britain on May 17, 1881, and three days later in the United States, after 11 years of labor, over 30,000 changes were made, of which more than 5,000 represent differences between the Greek text used for the Revised Version and that used as the basis of the King James Version. Most of the other changes were made in the interest of consistency or modernization. So again, you have these changes. You have from the Vetus Latina, all the codices, 
all the books that was translated into English. And I give you a list of all these people who gave you Bibles up until the point we get the King James Version where that was revised again. And then you have this book that people want to sit here and say it's perfect. There's nothing, nothing wrong with the book. Everything about the book is perfect. It's from God. It's inspired. What have you. These people do not know biblical history. These are people who have faith and belief in a book and do not know its history. Now, there's no way you can go through this history to any sane person with any sane person and get them to still come out and accept that book. You should have questions from day one once you understand that history, which is why the history is never taught to you. They don't go through this in church. They don't tell you that history because when you know the history, you look at the book with doubt. You look at that book with a lot of doubt and it's like whatever when you understand that history you look at the book completely different so then now we have to look at the history of it and then the fact that after all that you know everything that happened even before uh, the revision I'm talking about so even when we got taught the book during slavery it still wasn't considered perfect you get what I'm saying you know the 1880s that's after slavery so here again, you know, what we was taught has changed. And then now we have what we have. It, well, it was revised in whatever way. It was changed. And then you have, you can look in Revelations where it says, do not add or take away from the book. And we should all know and understand this fact that when you translate something, something is always lost in translation. The fact that one, they did not go out and teach the people Hebrew what the book was supposedly written in or Greek what the New Testament was, was written in, that they didn't teach the people these languages so they can read the book. They instead changed the book, which it says in the book, do not change. So again, you know, it's so many questions when you start to look at the scholarship and history of the book that you got to ask and you got to look at and, and uh, you know, have doubt and, and definitely do your research. OK, so now before we continue, let's sum this up and get people to really understand, because you got people who are truly confused about this point here that what should shut everything down is the fact that we got the book from the very people who was enslaving us plain and simple after all the history when you understand the history of the book and everything that it entails how could you then you know continue to follow that book but you got black people walking around saying that this is our history that the bible is black history so you have people you have these people who enslaved you, basically tortured you, treated you like crap, got rid of your history and the proof of any of your accomplishments, any of your achievements as a people, got rid of it. People who basically took your language, who basically, you know, covered up anything that we did, you know, that we can attribute to us being uh, not primitive us being actually intelligent people gone why would they go through all that why would they do all that then turn around and give you your history in a book that you can't even read and it's, it don't make sense why would they go through the slavery why would they go through tearing down and destroying african civilizations covering up our accomplishments just to give you your true history in a book and then why would god wait 200 years to revise it to make it correct after slavery. I mean, think about this. And then you have people that's going to say, this is going to be their reply to this. Their reply is going to be, well, it's nothing wrong with the book. Anybody who tell you that, as I always say, they never read it. It's nothing wrong with the book. It's the people who gave us the book. These Europeans are interpreting the book wrong. The white man is interpreting the book wrong. And the white man used the book to trick us and to keep us enslaved. Da, 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 da. But the book condones slavery. So how could they use the book to basically trick us when the book is condoning slavery? Plain and simple. That should tell you something. Oh, the book is fine. And God gave us the book. The book is okay. It's just the white man used it to condone it. No, the book is condoning it. The book, they're doing exactly what the book says they should do. Plain and simple. So you kill all that when you read Ephesians 6, 5, which says slaves obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart. Just as you would obey Christ. And I've said, how are we supposed to obey them and put them on the same par as Christ? Don't that sound like something that people who wrote the book, this white man, would put in this book? And then you have black people who don't 
get that, who, who, who can't see that simple fact. Plain and simple. It's right there. So the fact that it would say, you know, to put the slave masters on the same par as Christ definitely should raise, you know, eyebrows to look at that and say, how do we put these people that is responsible for the torture and murder and rape of people on the same par as Christ? He's talking about love, peace and mercy, forgiveness of what and what have you. You know, think about that. And people don't even fathom that. And then you have the Hebrews who come with this doctrine and then people don't, you know, fathom or put it together. The fact that you have one, the book condoning slavery, the book basically telling you to obey your slave masters as you would Christ. And the simple fact that we have in Deuteronomy uh, books, a doctrine that basically teaches that we are cursed. The reason why, you know, we should basically accept this is because we have been cursed and doomed to basically be enslaved by these people. And that the book is given to us by those very people, taught to us by the very people who's enslaving it, who's enslaving us. And then we go back and look and see the fact that the book's creation was by these same people. And the fact that other fucking white people didn't even want to believe the book. And that these people weren't even following the book themselves. All of that. Yet you still have people blinded by this book. You know, it's so much. It's so much. Even if you wanted to follow it. In truth, you couldn't because of all of these issues. Anything else will be like it's bullshit. But because it's this religion, people want to accept it because it has to deal with this spooky God. Anything else we would look at and say it's bullshit. So you have uh, a man named Dwight Callahan who basically wrote a book called The Talking Book. You know, it's about African-Americans and uh, the Bible, what have you. And, you know, during slavery and, all, and everything like that, you know, he was basically talking about how the slave master would, uh, you know, what a slave would ask, what was the book? He would say to the slave, well, the book talks to me. And, um, you know, it was one of the ways how they decided who would um, basically become the preacher. So if you say the book's talking to me, you would see, he would leave the book in a room and walk out and see who would go basically go in there and try to listen to the book. So then this way he can be like, well, the book is speaking to me. I'm going to tell you what it's saying and you tell it to the people. And this is how you pick out your, your so-called preachers who's going to be telling the people, well, this is what the book said. This is what Master told me that the book said, and I'm going to preach it to y'all, you know. So he basically was interviewed about the book and about everything he, uh, you know, researched and discovered about slavery and what was going on. And I want to go through a couple of the questions uh, so you can see what he was uh, basically asked. It says here, so he's asked, so how did the Bible become essentially a spoken word for many people? talking about basically black people well in several ways perhaps one of the most important way particularly in the early phase of what we could call the christianization of the african slaves was through music when the slaves encountered these stories they made the stories their own through the music that we now call the negro spirituals and so stories of the bible were communicated then were remembered in a kind of musical shorthand and so the Negro spirituals were, of course, shot through with biblical references and biblical images. That's the vocabulary of the Negro spirituals, if you will. So then he's asked, now there was a situation between Frederick Douglass and his contemporary where they argue over sending Bibles to Southern slaves. How did that play out? It says here, he says, well, there was really a debate between two groups of African Americans. One that advocated the Bible be sent to the South. Frederick Douglass rose up and argued against this. Here's a man who had been illiterate. Frederick Douglass, amazingly enough, even though some people refer to him in his lifetime as the greatest orator in America, this is a man who didn't learn to read until he was an adult. He told himself and he learned of the Bible first or by hearing it read by his master and his mistress. As always, the interpretation of the Bible reflects the interests of those who interpret it. Remember that when you go to church, anybody who's still gone, the interpretation of the Bible reflects the interests of those who interpret it, which is why when you go to church, your preacher is giving you sermons and anything that's going to reference, you know, money, poverty. Oh, this is why you ain't getting your, you know, your harvest. This is why you ain't doing this. This is why your life is like this all the time when you go to church, the preachings and the teachings. Somehow it's going to revert back to money. It always gets into money at some point and how you being selfish and how you should share and how you're going to get your blessings from giving. 
You get what I'm saying? That's the agenda. He's interpreted in a way so you can see yourself as giving money and receiving something in return. So now it goes on to say, so for the slaveholding class, the Bible was very important for them as a warrant for what they understood to be their right to own slaves, to own people. And they preached it that way, that the Bible says that they were to be slaves. They were to be obedient slaves, that that was God's will. And there are passages in the Bible that suggest that, as I have read. And he heard those passages, slaves be obedient to your masters. And he knew that those are the passages that those slaves in the South would hear over and over and over again. And so he thought it would be better for them to not have that book at all. 